Thank you, Kayvon, for um, joining us, joining me here today. A little background on Kayvon Shoka, and uh, as we were discussing, I'm actually, as we would say here, super chuffed to have a chance to chat with you today. I got my new vocabulary word of the day. Oh, no, I am working the Scottish. It's, it's really sad. Um, I'm annoying my wife to no end on this. Okay, so, uh, so Kayvon was born in Nevada, but raised in Berkeley, a suburb of Berkeley, I should say. Um, so you're really a Cali boy. Uh, you got your BA in chemistry from Reed College. A lot of interesting people I know come from Reed College. Your PhD at Berkeley, which I, my understanding uh, is that that was really a formative time for you. You got the PhD in 1991 uh, with Peter Schultz. And it seems that you had a very interesting and, and, and um, important relationship with Peter. Um, who really motivated you to um, focus on a PhD in chemistry as you were deciding where to go with your life. Uh, you postdoc um, uh, more on an immunology postdoc with uh, Christopher uh, Goodnow at Stanford University. Uh, your first faculty position was at Princeton. Then you went to UC Berkeley, which somehow you're still a professor there. And currently, um, you're formerly chair and now you're professor at UCSF, which you've really become an icon and a fixture there, as well as investigator for the Howard Hughes Medical Institute. So a little bit of traveling, but you've, you've stayed put for, um, I guess, more than 20 years there now. Yeah. Uh, you have founded or co-founded quite a list of companies. Um, I won't go through all of them, Metallicine, Araxes, Effector, Wellspring, and so on. And these are companies that have really uh, been interesting in that not only have they shown success on their own, but I think these companies have really motivated the pharmaceutical industry in general to drive itself forward in certain areas. So it's been a, both um, uh, an outlet for you and I think a tool to move the field forward, which I think is pretty cool. Yeah. Uh, you've won many awards and really many awards, and I think you're going to get a few more after uh, last week's um, uh, uh, approval. Uh, um, I'll just say I'm elected to the National Academy of Sciences. That's cool. That's congratulations, the AAAS, and so on. So uh, Kayvon is married to a physician, Deborah. You have three children, and I'm, so I apologize to them if I butcher their names, Kasra, Mitra, and Layla. Wow, perfect. <laughs> Seriously? Yes. Wow. Okay, that will work. Um, and I know that you take family quite seriously. We'll get back to the family later. Um, not, not too deep, but a little bit. Uh, in terms of the research, so I should probably say that uh, Kevin and I actually we first uh, connected a bit through your postdoc Arvind Dar um, on a SARC inhibitor. As my lab had stepped into SARC, and you were, um, or at least Arvind was working on SARC in your lab. But I think where we really connected was in your role as a chemical biologist. So I was at a meeting in Stanford, and then I w I wanted somebody to work with to sort of turn genetics into chemistry. And they all said the same thing, which is, oh, you should talk to this guy, Kayvon Shokat. I'm like, Kayvon, that sounds familiar. I feel like we're doing something with this guy. So I took the Caltrain up, right? I, I contacted you and then said, hey, let's have lunch. And a little bit to my surprise, you said, sure, let's do that. And I think my point to this is what I was very impressed by is that um, we sat down, I, I just launched into fly genetics and you said, yeah, yeah, I get that. And you did get it and you were asking questions and you kind of dived into the biology of it. And I think you either understood or did a great job faking your understanding of fly genetics and how you could turn that into evolving drugs. And it was, you know, it was an early form of what we ended up doing together. But yeah, yeah. What, what I was really struck by was um, there is this term chemical genetics and you're considered one of the leaders in that field but you really are somebody who thinks as a chemical geneticist, which I think is, first of all, let me say is very impressive. I think you embrace biology. You have had some training in biology. You weren't straight up chemistry. And I think it shows, but also um, uh, your ability to quickly talk that language to make people like me feel comfortable so that we can work with you and just get on with the business of it. <laughs> I think it's very interesting. So from oh, a biologist oh. standpoint, I have not seen that very often. So where am I going with all of this? There is a question coming out of this, <laughs> <laughs> which is, um, so how did you become so comfortable speaking with biologists? Do you see this as a fundamental part of who you are as a, I guess, a chemical geneticist? 
And how is that different, for example, from drug development, or is it all one and the same? Yeah, I mean, I got really, um, you know, interested in thinking about biology probably from my PhD with Pete, because I think he really was one of the first chemists to think very, very, uh, you know, deeply about biology, not not biological problems like biologists think of them, but biological opportunities, you know, like a chemist would look at them. And so I still remember him first telling me about the, you know, 21st amino acid insertion. And it just, you know, hit me like a train. I was just like, what on earth? I just never, you know, conceived of that. And so when I worked on catalytic antibodies and learned about B cells and the immune system and my PhD, then it prompted me to go to Chris's lab and, and, and work on you know, B cell tolerance. And that's where I, I thought about you know, genetics a bit because Chris just set up this unbelievable system to study B cell tolerance, you know, inserting a HEG and a HEN you know, henaglycozyme, a neo antigen, neo self antigen, and just using genetics to make a monoclonal B cell repertoire. I mean, it just, just, I was just like, wow, these, these elegant systems where you use genetics to create, you know, this perfect, you know, microscope to look at uh, something um, really just took hold, I guess that that's kind of what I, I that's how I got thinking about it and, and that. Sure. Well, there's also the, uh, boy, there's so many questions to ask about this. So, um, I mean, there's certainly a skill that you have, which is that you um, make people feel comfortable to work with. It strikes me that um, in the sorts of um, chemistry that you do, it's fundamental that you're able to work well with others. Um, I know that you've had people from your parents to your mentors uh, that have sort of influenced you in these ways, but if you could talk to a young chemist today, um, what would you tell them in terms of how to approach others, how to be open to those? What are the sort of links to being successful to sort of drag your chemistry into different directions? Yeah, I guess, um, you know, there's just infinite number of things you could do, uh, you know, with your time in science. Uh, and I, I find the best, you know, way to collaborate with people is, is when there's, First of all, you know, a sort of a common, you know, sort of uh, ease of interaction. So, you know, you can bring uncomfortable data and they, you know, you can tell from those first interactions, you know, when you ask them a question, do they just scoff, you know, say, you know, boy, that's a stupid question. It's like, wow, that's going to be a sign. I better not. Because when we get deep into the science, as you know, we did, there are always, as we all know, there's times when the data doesn't, you know, line up. And um, so you want that. And you also just want to be very, very curious about the biological question. That's, that's what I've found. It's like, I could have a lot of things seem right in a collaboration, but if the biological question is too high, you know, for me away from the chemistry, I know I'll just lose, you know, I just won't have that motivation. I Is that right? Think. So have you actually, you know, declined or walked away from? I haven't. Yeah, I have. Or, you know, just by lack of, you know, continuing to kind of engage, sure. which is a bad way to do it. You should probably tell people right away that, but you don't know until, you know, sort of. Um, but I have had things where we've had projects in the lab where a student really wants to pursue it. And, and I said, yeah, let's do it. It sounds like it's gonna be close to what we do. But then as the project develops, if the student is great, they take it on, but then it gets like layer upon layer away from the chemistry, then it gets harder. Um, then I try, cause it's a student in the lab to bring in another collaborator that it's, I know that that is their expertise. And so that's fun, but um, I'd rather, you know, at the beginning, know roughly the, the parameters uh, of that. Yeah. So are you getting, well, I don't know, more comfortable is the right word, but I know you're expanding into other arenas, pink one with Parkinson's, things like that, COVID even. 
yeah. seen <laughs> videos of you talking about COVID, which is pretty cool and very timely. <laughs> yeah. um, so are you more interested in, I'm just going to work on an interesting question, or do you try to rein your lab, no, we do this, and maybe we'll... Yeah, I, I guess I try to just work on interesting questions. I don't try to say what we will or won't do. Yeah, like you said, the COVID was was amazing. Uh, I mean, I mean, I'm really embarrassed to say this. I'm probably on a recording. I shouldn't say this, but, you can always, but like, always remove it. <laughs> the first week of the COVID, of COVID hitting and us here at UCSF with Nevin Krogan setting up this QCRG, mm. we were in a room you know, before the shutdown, about 10 of us. And somebody said, well, you know, how are we gonna get enough virus to study in LL? And somebody said, well, you know, we gotta infect human cells and have it replicate. And actually it dawned on me, it's like, it didn't ever, until somebody said it that way, it didn't dawn on me that viruses need cells to replicate. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's so embarrassing. I keep telling Nevin how embarrassing that is. But it's, I think it's just, you know, just you come from chemistry. There's a lot of holes <laughs> in your in your knowledge. Uh, but I think the most important thing is to always ask the, ask the question that's on your mind because nobody knows everything. And so you've got to make sure you just don't have gaps. But that's an embarrassing gap. But... <laughs> Well, I know, you know, it's part of my job in this interview to like say nice things to you, but I have to say <laughs> one of the really um, endearing, well, I don't know if endearing is the right word, but things that I really loved made me feel comfortable is that there is a humbleness that you're willing to say, you know, COVID, flagenics, whatever it is, it's like, well, that's pretty cool. I don't really, yeah, I don't fully understand that, but that's fine, right? That's yeah, the leverage yeah. you're about. No, I remember our collaboration so well. And, you know, once we, you know, moved the mutants from, you know, which cells you express it in, so they'd come up early and late. I just love that. And to you, it was, you know, second nature and something you did 20 years before we started working together. But I guess it just, it never ceases to amaze me the power of, you know, tried and true tools and promoters and, you know, wing, you know, imaginal disc pattern. I mean, just things are, it, it, the, the the arc of, of, of things in biology that are so profound, but it's so great to learn about them whenever you learn about them, whether they were 20 years old or what, you know. Well, thanks. And certainly the same way back in the chemistry. And uh, I, I did learn that the power of adding fluorines to things is pretty amazing. Yes. <laughs> The magic fluorine, yes. Yeah, I was chatting with somebody who I think assumed I was a chemist. <laughs> so, and, then, and at one point I said, why don't you just add a fluorine to that, which I, that's all I had hey. to say. And he actually called the student and I think they did the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Well, yeah, we had some very special fluorines right at the end of our project. That was all true. worked. It all worked. <laughs> but anyway, um, so, so I think the, the, all of these things um, to me are what makes one part of you very interesting. And the other part, of course, is your um, willingness to plunge in. And I know that some like Frank McCormick have pushed you in, in these directions, but your willingness to take on problems that were very challenging. I know this past week has been, uh, I thought you might be pretty excited. Yes. Uh, yes, you're pretty excited looking at your um, Twitter account. Um, let, let me just say that you, you've identified a number of uh, chemical approaches, uh, um, for example, um, Let's see, where is my list? You've got such a list. Uh, chemo, uh, um, so k uh, especially, at least initially, was kinase inhibitors. Um, however, you, obviously, you've, you've moved on from that. But uh, d during that time, the bump and hole method for identifying targets, really powerful um, and very clever, I have to say. Even I could understand this when I read the paper. I'm like, that is cool. <laughs> um, but perhaps what may um, turn out to be, at least for now, one of your most impactful uh, uh, identifications was to publish the first covalent inhibitor of a RAS protein, RAS G12C, um, showing how um, the mutation and your compound creates a pocket for drug binding. I don't know how you came up with the idea of the drug creating a pocket. <laughs> and I realize that that's crazy. Um, so RAS was at that point, and I feel like it still has this name just because it's had it so long as being one of the undruggables yeah. and called the Death Star of cancer targets, which I like. Yeah. <laughs> um, so 
tell me a little bit about this. So it's, first of all, uh, soda Rasib, if I'm saying that right, I think that's, uh, was I think approved that's last right. week for yeah. uh, small cell clone cancer. So sort of a broad congratulations. This has to be really nice to, oh, yeah. to see this happen. But I think what's to me almost equally amazing is how fast everything happened. So you published your original paper in 2013. It's eight years later, add COVID. And here we are to an approval, which I don't know, that seems pretty crazy fast to me. Were you surprised how quickly things moved and why did things move so quickly? Yeah, I mean, there were a lot of pieces to, to having it um, work quickly. I mean, I should go back and sort of give one little uh, point to when when we published our paper in 2013 there were already people were you know coming up with molecules that could bind to RAS um, in 2012 there was um, there were I think three papers that I can think of one from Genentech and then one from Vanderbilt uh, Steve Fessick they had done some NMR screening and found a little pocket and a little small indole-like molecule that would bind, but it it was pretty weak, didn't have a lot of affinity. And then um, actually, I think the first G12C compound was from Nathaniel Gray's lab, and he made a covalent molecule that was based on GTP. So the GTP had the electrophile. And so as we were getting ready to publish ours, we saw, whoa, wait a minute, geez, we better. Uh, and, um, and so, we, you know, our, our approach was this, this other pocket we identified called the switch two pocket, which was distinct from those others. And our molecule was also pretty weak. I mean, we had sort of just sort of the beginning of cellular activity, but I think what really saved it was, and, and made it go very fast was that I started working with uh, Eliu, Ping De Ren and Troy Wilson. And we started uh, this company called Araxes. So they just launched into that MedChem optimization. And about 2016, a Patricelli paper in Cancer Discovery, they published the first really good cell mo molecule. And then um, a couple of years later in Cell, Janes et al., they published a beautiful animal, you know, uh, active molecule. So, you know, if we had published that paper in 2013 and had not started a company, I think pharma would have looked at the paper and kind of played around with it and not taken it further. I've, I've talked to other people at meetings that were at companies and, you know, they, they, they that was the period where people at companies were like, there's a replication crisis in uh, re reproducibility crisis in, 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 in academia. All these academics are publishing molecules. We can never go forward with it. The Amgen group themselves were the most famous one. They, they published a paper that said 75% of things they look at are not, you know, believable. Yeah. So I've heard from pharma companies that they took our paper, made every single molecule that was key and reproduced our activity, but also saw not, you know, not, not like developable activity. And so they would have been like, well, this might work once, but it's not going to develop. But when Ian Pingda really took it on, they, because we had a great relationship from previous company, they said, we believe this molecule, we're going to work on it and see how, and they optimized it. And now that scaffold they discovered is in the core of every other uh, G12C molecule. So to me, the fast part, it was really credited to them because I don't think the other companies, uh, yeah, yeah, even Amgen has credited their patents to sort of, you know, include elements that they, uh, they, they didn't have in their screens and things. But um, also it's just like we talked about earlier, RAS, you know, tumors are very RAS addicted. And once people discovered that and that there was a chemical that you could find, it went very fast because that's, that's, that's the, that goes back to, viral SARC and BCR able once you <laughs> once you have that you you know you can you can get a response sure so um, that's that's really interesting because I guess that's an example of again using a comp so your job is to solve the RAS problem in part you did that by 
establishing or encouraging a company to help drive that whole thing forward, which I think is really interesting. So I just want to push you a little bit, and um, and this is in no way meant to um, disrespect the molecule in any way. I think it's amazing, but um, so it it shows, you know, it shows efficacy for months, but not years, and yeah. that's fairly typical for um, precision medicine molecules. And you know, I, I'm all in on. I mean, my lab spends efforts doing this as well. Yeah. Um, so so I'm, I'm obviously a believer, but. Um, it's a little annoying and a little frustrating that you don't give it to a patient and they're cured, right? Yeah. Which I feel like is our actual job. So what do you yes. think is, and you can take this as general as you want. Yeah. What yeah. do you think is the ceiling for uh, uh, drugs in general? And what do you, and how are we going to break through that sort of initial ceiling? Yeah. I think that is right now the key question in oncology because you know, if we just keep making drugs that give us six months extra, it isn't, that isn't the real, you know, breakthrough. Uh, you know, I, I think what you see in the checkpoint therapy where some patients are, you know, are essentially cured. I mean, to me, a cure would be a patient that has cancer, get some treatment, and when they finally pass away, it's not because of their cancer. Right now, it is the other way, right? Yeah. Um, and I think that you can look at BCR ABLE and you know, see that you know, in CML, I think it's something like 30% is the number. My colleague Neil Shaw told me that you know, patients on, on inhibitors of BCR ABLE, they can be cytologically converted to tumor free, you know, but still 70% will get a mutation and a gatekeeper residue. And then, you know, so even when we know there are patients that can be, can, you know, uh, cured, we still don't quite understand why the 70% and the 30% is my understanding. So I think we need better molecules. I think we need, you know, molecules that are sort of just drive the signaling down to probably, you know, 2% of, of what is there. So that to me is, you know, um, is, is probably one answer. The other is molecules that are more specific for the mutant and don't inhibit the wild type. You know, as we know that's, that's a challenge. If you've got inhibition in the body and you've got inhibition on the tumor, how do you squeeze that away? And that's what's great about the G12C drug. It's only inhibiting the mutant, which is in the, only in the tumor. So now it's a backbone for many combinations that I think will really, I think there will be some cures because when we get the right combination, uh, there should be just a profound response. And then of course, moving it early and earlier and earlier, I mean, I think we just had a talk at the RAS meeting with NCI that Charlie Swanton talked about the diversification, you know, of, of tumors and evolution. So we've got to, you know, get it before it arborizes. You've got to get the truncal mutants and things like that. So I think it's going to come in the next five years, certainly in 10 years, but um, it's going to be sort of some chemistry, some combination. It's going to be some, you know, I think early detection is great. It a, seems like a panacea. I don't know about that. You know, I don't want us to put all of our eggs in that basket. I, I want, I want, I just think that, uh, you know, if we can get to earlier therapy uh, and the right molecules, I, I think that is what we should be focusing. I, I want to talk with Ned Sharpless and sort of say that that should be the NCI's mission. You know, we've got a lot of six month things, which are great, but now let's go for a functional cure. Yeah. Sure. So you think you're, do you think, do you think we have to push a little bit more on that? Do you think we are, that you're in the right chemical space and you just need to mature it? Or do you think there's going to be a need for new scaffolds? Also, while um, we're talking about this, I'll throw in polypharm, mm -hmm. um, which itself, is somehow controversial. Um, so maybe talk a little bit about all of these. Yeah, I, th I think we, you know, when, when you get to like a target, 
and then you say scaffolds, I think you can swap in and out scaffolds. The question is, you know, can you get durable, you know, potent inhibition? Um, and that can, that can come from a brand new screen. You know, that's how vemurafenib, the, the RAF inhibitor that was a breakthrough came. You know, they had serafinib, you know, as we worked on, uh, yeah. but they just took a step back and said, let's start with tiny scaffolds at Plexicon and find a beginning and then grow it out, which is this sort of fragment-based drug discovery, which is probably the biggest breakthrough in drug discovery in, you know, the last 20 years. And it, it's very power. It's a very powerful way to get the most drug-like low molecular weight high ligand efficient, all these properties that make drugs very, very good. Um, but now there's just, you know, there's like the covalent approach. It helps you get to more, you know, potent and, you know, full inhibition. There's the, the ProTac approach from Craig Cruz and Celgene and many, many other companies and, and people now, which degrades proteins. And, um, but what is awesome is that every way you perturb a biological system, there's some difference between getting rid of the protein, sticking a drug in its active site and leaving the scaffold there, mm -hmm. sticking an active site, you know. So I, I think the molecular glues have opened up people's eyes to, you know, bringing things together, being a different kind in the context of degrading a protein. But you know, bringing two things together can, even without their degradation, can create a signal to the cell. And that I think is going to be a very big, you know, continuing emerging thing. And when you say polypharmacology, I really like that, not only because we worked on it so much and I believe that it has such a promise and that's how drugs are special, but I think it's also keeping that in mind is going to keep people uh, aware of when there's something special about a molecule, it's probably a polypharmacological kind of, of aspect. And finding the special molecules is really what drug discovery is all about. And so it's, uh, it's great to see more biological kind of thinking around a special molecule. You know, people are digging to find out what, why is it special? And I've heard some talks recently about old kinase inhibitors and now that we have many of them, you can see which one's special. And then you can figure out why it's special. And I, I think there's gonna be a, a sort of a, another surge of, of polypharmacology coming. So it should be, should be really interesting. Well, since this, um, it's interesting. So since this is a, uh, for a, a RAS issue of DMM, uh, I'll just uh, sort of um, finish out the RAS part by asking you, so what are you, so if we were to talk, have this conversation again in 10 years, what are you most excited about? What are you, or, or at least maybe not excited about, what are you most intrigued by? Um, so maybe it'll work, maybe it won't. What are you most intrigued by in going after RAS? Um, yeah, the immediate, which is I think already here, but kind of hidden in companies and people are not sort of showing all the molecules yet. I think we have molecules uh, that We'll go after each of the alleles. Uh, the C we've already got approved, the aspartate and the valine, the next high bigger ones actually than cysteine. Right. But then even the esoteric, the, the more rare ones uh, we've got. So once we get all that chemical matter on that, I, I think there will be a, another group of molecules that will sort of emerge like Maybe an ERK inhibitor is great, or a MEK inhibitor, or a RAF inhibitor, or a SHIP inhibitor. You know, there's going to be all the small molecule part. So once we get through that, I feel like that's the second wave of having that. Then I think the immune oncology connection, because RAS is such a, um, a good suppressor of the immune system. So now that we've got agents to sort of take that suppression off, the checkpoint therapies will probably work. I mean, especially in G12C where these are caused by smoking. So they've got a lot of high tumor mutation burden. There's gonna be that. But, you know, pancreatic is not a particularly high mutational burden uh, tumor type. So the checkpoint may not 
have enough to grab onto. So, you know, um, there's just beautiful work coming out of Hopkins from uh, Bert Vogelstein's uh, and Drew Pardall and, you know, Ken Kinsler and these guys who've made antibodies to the KRAS mutant peptide on MHC. They call them antibodies. So once we can, you know, get more immune recognition of what's going on inside a KRAS mutant cell, that is going to be another bump, you know. And so I hope, yeah, I guess what I hope is I hope I don't even know right now what 10 years is going to, you know, show. I hope that's just five years. <laughs> I think we can both agree that it's likely. Yeah, yeah. Whatever it is, we don't know about it yet. Yeah. Um, for sure. So, um, uh, so beyond RAS um, and beyond KIs, um, what's, what's happening and what's on the horizon for the Shokat lab? Yeah, I mean, we're just working on um, kind of, I, we made a molecule that um, a, a few years ago to deal with resistance mutants in mTOR that, that sort of has this bivalent nature. So it's a, we call it a bitopic inhibitor from the GPCR literature. And so you can bind a sort of allosteric and an orthosteric site. And so if you get mutations and so those are very cool molecule and one of the companies, Revolution Medicines put it into the clinic. So after they've optimized it. So, but what opened our eyes on that molecule is that thing is 1700 molecular weight. I mean, you know, it's like, the complete outlier of, of really things that would be able to get into cells. So I, I feel like we, and we're working on this now, we need sort of a better understanding of actually how molecules get into cells. <laughs> it's stunning that that, <laughs> you know, is it a, is it an uptake receptor? Is it passive permeability? Is it, you know, avoiding the efflux? I mean, we know a lot of those things, but I think a lot of people, when they think about that, uh, realize actually there's still a lot of mysteries. I mean, you know, with Keith Yamamoto, we always, you know, come back to like, how do glucocorticoids get across the cell membrane? <laughs> it's like, I don't know. And I, I was like, what? You studied this for how long? So that's one thing. The other thing is if we could get to understanding of how bigger molecules get across, I think that opens up new targets because some things you just need a bigger foothold. Um, you told then, me all molecules had to be small. Seriously. <laughs> I, and that was before we, <laughs> exactly. We made this molecule almost like to just, it won't work and then it worked. So that's those, those are those, one of those experiments. Um, and then the other thing is, I, I really, uh, I guess I want to think more about a brand new mode of, of, of recognition, um, which is not recognizing the three-dimensional shape of proteins, but recognizing their primary sequence. If we could, it's sort of a you know, we've got siRNA, we've got CRISPR, we've got base editors, so we can deal with linear sequences in the nucleotides. And, uh, you know, with a uh, good friend of Seema Ansari, we, he's got these beautiful things from Peter Durvin's lab that recognize, you know, the minor groove in a sequence specific way. So there's a lot of things people have worked on for many years of sequence specific, you know, linear recognition in the DNA and RNA side. But in proteins, we've always been three-dimensional lock key, you know? And um, there was a molecule that was discovered at Pfizer in a cell-based screen for blocking a certain cardiovascular target called PCSK9. And out of like 2 million molecules, they found one <laughs> that blocked its production. And, and they, they couldn't figure out what it was doing. They put it aside, they went back to other screens. And all of a sudden they couldn't find anything else. So they went back and figured out what that molecule did. And it bound in the exit tunnel of the ribosome. While the PCSK9 nascent chain was really going through. Yeah. It's not like you, you know, one specific, it's about 18 of the 2000. Specificity? Yeah. About 18 sequences out of 2000 that were in the ribosome profiling were blocked. So it's, you know, 
it's a pretty stunning thing, but it, it gives, and yeah, I mean, we know that, you know, from the antibiotic world, there are natural products that do that. Um, but this was the first synthetic example of that. So I, I really think that I would like to sort of explore the possibility of that more because, you know, anything that gets you a, a completely new target uh, recognition, it, it really um, opens up a lot of doors. Yeah. One of the things I love, so it's one of the things I love about chemistry, you know, as a not chemist, but chemistry adjacent person is, um, and, and also the way you approach it is um, it much like genetics and doing genetic screens, um, there's a bit of a bottom line, there's a bit of a hypothesis generating aspect to what you're just describing, which is you find something that turns your assay in a direction you want it, and then you yes. go figure out what it does. It's the same in genetics, right? Yeah, yeah. You just look exactly. for an outcome and then you figure out what is this thing. Exactly, exactly. So cool. I like that. Yeah, that that those kinds of things are just eye-opening. Yeah, yeah. Very cool. All right. So um, now there, there's always the questions about um, advice to the young and all that. So we're gonna we're gonna enter that realm a little bit. Um, so how is so this is gonna be a shift. <laughs> so I apologize for that. So how is the chemistry field different today? So what are the characteristics of a successful 2021 chemist? Um, wow. Um, and feel free to contrast that to, you know, you said in Peter's lab, you, you had eight to 10 projects and yeah, it's not going to happen today. And yeah, so how, how are things different today? And yeah, that I, yeah, I'm trying to think it was a great question to think about. Um, I, to say which way to take it. I mean, um, chem just chemistry is just so different than biology. That was part of one of the things that made it hard for me to be in an immunology lab. It's like chemists just have this engineering mindset. Like I want to find a reaction to do this, you know, and that's what I'm going to work on. Whereas biologists, they come from the question. And um, so it's, it's really hard to think what a successful chemistry, I mean, I guess I should just put it in, you know, context of chemical biologists because that there are a lot of chemical biologists in, in, uh, in, uh, in academic chemistry departments. And I think for them, it's, you know, um, still many of the same challenges that we had, you know, how can you come up with a molecule that will, you know, do X and, and, uh, you know, you could come from a synthetic expertise. So you're going to be comfortable making hundreds of molecules really fast, you know, or if you're more from the biological side, you'll put two things together to make a new function, you know, uh, and there's still so much great work going on of that. Uh, but I feel now there's a lot more, when, when I started, when a lot of people that trained in chemistry and the people in a lab that were getting their PhDs, most of them would go to the pharma industry and they would either make molecules or they would maybe set up assays, but they would never do both together. But now pharma is realizing that, you know, you really need to be thinking, the chemists need to be thinking about the biology uh, a lot. So there's a lot more sort of um, realization of what to work on that is relevant to drug discovery and biological impact. And that the sophistication has gone up so much. Uh, so yeah, be before um, it was a lot of baby steps of things, you know, um, so, yeah. So I wonder just the guide, you know, without the intent of guiding, so I wonder if, because I, I know this is true in my world, which is that um, a lot of stuff that we had to make when we were literally physically make, when yeah. we were at the bench back in the day, you can, you can just order and have it show up. And I know in chemistry, you can order, you know, a, a modules now and, and paste them and, and piece them together. And of course, there's more to it than that, but at least you have that base. 
And there are kits that you can order just like in molecular biology and even in fly genetics, you can just order sets of flies and they come as a group. Yeah. So I wonder if, if there's more of an emphasis now on a little bit more big picture because you can say, okay, now I can get a little more to the question because yeah. even if I'm not an expert in this, I can just get it, the kid in and follow yeah. it and get that part done. Or I can go yeah. to a CRO and say, please do this for me. So I wonder if it's as much organization and thinking about questions. Yeah. And maybe it was a little bit, I mean, we had to do it, but it was more challenging then because you also had the blizzard of dealing with all the details of getting stuff to work. Yeah, no, I think that is right. So I, I look at that as like, there should be, you know, a lot more time with new students spent on strategy of what you are going to try to do because you're right, you, you don't need to spend all that time uh, sort of expressing and purifying TAC polymerase like we used to, <laughs> you know? So, you know, it, it's just so many things like that. Um, in fact, I kind of swung it the other way is that, you know, we would, the lab would just buy so many reagents and you could think of an experiment and you could go on the computer and order it and two days later it would come. And COVID really, you know, it was hard. We didn't have much time in the lab because there was a, our density shut down and things. And I felt like everything got drawn out. And so I thought, what if we just flip it around and we say, everybody in the lab, come up with an experiment you can do with reagents that are in our lab right now that you can do in one week. How creative, how like, what, what can we do with that, that and that really prompted a lot of, you know, creativity of like, oh yeah, that thing from, you know, two months ago that I parked, I can combine it with this other thing. And that is actually a really good, you know, thing for us to try. So just, and the availability of, gosh, so much supplementary information and papers, you know, buried in tables, you know, of, CRISPR and RNA-seq, you know, there's just, it, it feels like uh, there's just so much wealth of information, but it's, you know, how you connect it and, and the shortest path to an interesting answer, you know, is, is what I'm trying to do more and more of. Uh, it's, it's, yeah. That's interesting. You know, artists often say that they get most creative when you apply constraints to them. Really? So yeah. I think that's what you're saying, right? Yeah. Did it, did it work? Did you come up with some cool stuff? Yeah. Yeah. There were things that were like, you know, you know, just sitting there and, you know, uh, and, and, and we really, really kind of gave us something that um, it wasn't like the ultimate goal of the original, but it was like a rock solid piece that gave us a step in that direction that we didn't have before. So. Yeah. Yeah. That, that constraint thing dawned on me like 10 years ago and I kind of RAS is a perfect example of it is like, whenever I would talk with Frank about RAS, he would just be like, you know, it's an enzyme that's broken, stuck in GTP, you know, just, there were always the, the things that he and Biddinghofer and, you know, people had, had uncovered and they just seemed like, just walls, you know, just like, okay, that's a wall, can't get over that. And I think it was like 10 years ago, it just dawned on me that that constraint is actually a great way to focus. And there's another kind of creativity. Cause I think in chemical biology, we're always like, oh, I can do this. So then I do that, you know, but there's only like the biology, you know, and the disease is only one thin lane and you have to stay in that. Uh, but that, that constraint is what I'm really after now, you know, make sure that, you know, uh, you, you maximize the creativity within the constraints. Cause I mean, we know that from cancer. I mean, it's, RAS is there. It's not going to go away until we, you know, figure out a way to, to find a drug for it. You know, incidentally, I know Frank's a good guy and he can be very persuasive, but 
why did you listen to him and why in the world? Because <laughs> he's just so... the work on that? Oh, he, well, because I listened to him twice. You know, when I first came to UCSF, he says, Kayvon, Pietri kinase is highly mutated. That's an important oncogene. And so we started working on it. And, uh, and uh, my student, Zach Knight, just, you know, just had a beautiful you know, set of papers uncovering new molecules that went into the clinic. And boy, I was like, Frank knows his targets. You know, when we started on it, it was not really that uh, sort of uh, apparent. And then, boy, that was just great from like 2002 until 2010. And so all those years he kept saying, but remember RAS, like that's the one. And, uh, <laughs> and, and it did, you know, it just, he kept inviting people like Fred Wittinghofer and I was really got to be good friends with Roger Goody. And these guys were at the Max Planck and Dortmund had just done all these incredible experiments there to, you know, structure biochemistry, cell biology. And uh, again, it just was constrained. It just kept, I, I, he's just like, just kept realizing that the problem is that protein, you know? And, uh, and my colleague, Jack Taunton here was working on irreversible inhibitors. And so cysteines were always, you know, sort of uh, around. And so then it, and then Jim Wells had this tethering library. So yeah, I felt it was just a, you know, a, a lucky uh, chance to put all these pieces together uh, at the right time. So he created a virtual community, in other words. Yeah. Interesting. Oh, and now he's doing it at the NCI. I mean, it's amazing. And it just goes to show you how many gaps there are in our knowledge, even if we studied something for 30 years intensely. It's like it takes somebody to realize, wait a minute, this and this don't match up. You know, you know that from genetics so much, right? You get down to the final points and you're like, something can't quite be right here. What is it? Which piece of data is, you know, and, and I'm really, uh, yeah. Yeah, when, when I got to UCSF, I worked on the cell cycle with Dave Morgan and got to be here a little bit of time before Andrew Murray left and Tim Mitchison left. And I would just remember in group meetings, they would know... <laughs> you know, 10 years ago, papers, figures and lanes. <laughs> and I was like, well, who are these people? What do they have? <laughs> and then now I can, you know, I'm getting closer on, on that. that some of things. Yeah. I, I love that. I love having that information <laughs> mm -hmm. at your fingertips. Yeah. Yeah. Really interesting. All right. I'm going to respect your time. So just a couple more, a couple more things. Uh, one is, um, so I know your family's been important to you. Um, and you made some even decisions and sacrifices for those. I know your uh, parents, for example, were very politically active. I must be curious where I'm going with this. I know you and um, Deborah have been also pretty active over the years. Um, maybe you're a little busier now. So where do you see the role of scientists in today's public discourse? This is something you must have thought about. Wow, yeah, I mean, yeah, just, yeah, this pandemic year, you just realize, you know, so frustrating to have this unbelievable vaccine technology emerge so quickly. Of course, we all know it took a long lead time, but then to have that sitting there and have it become this political football where you can't, you know, actually impact the science. So, you know, I'm struggling with that right now. I'm struggling with how to, you know, make the, you know, discoveries sort of, you know, in science we build, <laughs> you know, and then to have this thing where you can have this mountain of discoveries and this vaccine, but then have some people look at it and say, there's no mountain there. There's nothing there. there don't use that. Don't, don't take. So it's really challenging. I mean, uh, my daughter, actually, Layla, uh, she just graduated from Reed and, and she's going to do a um, master's, hopefully in Scotland, actually in Edinburgh with uh, yeah. in the science and communications. Uh, group. She's, I will, I will. I'm going to visit too. So. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And she she really she did a great thesis on the ethnography of the COVID research group here and the science and how people communicate 
confusing results and you know which instruments they use and so i feel like the more we can communicate what how science is done maybe that's a gap in 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 the public not understanding and uh you know just there's the constant revision that goes on in our thinking sure. and and uh, those ideas but um i'm i'm certainly uh you know I, I love telling people about the discoveries and and how they were made and i think sometimes that really can get people through because it's it's not uh it's not so foreign if you break it down in a interesting way yeah I've, well, i wonder um and this would go to your advice to young scientists i wonder if there could be some filling in of the gap between you and me and your daughter right there must be as we train scientists i wonder if we could fill in that gap some yeah yeah no i think um you know the one thing i try to do is is really get the students and postdocs in the lab to give talks where the you know it you don't just dive so deeply into the, the 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 tiny parts but you give people a better perspective and i feel like if we do that amongst ourselves then you know we're going to have the ability to explain it to somebody but um but it's uh yeah, we, we did a thing with uh, our families, Deborah and I, uh, a few months ago about COVID. And we I presented a set of slides on a Zoom to the family. And then uh, she did one on the vaccine. And it was great. I mean, great. it never, yeah, yeah, it never ceases to amaze me. The fantastic questions that people who don't do science come up with when you explain the science in a compelling way, you know, or not compelling, uh, and just, mm. just in normal language. Yeah, I love one of my students, when he graduated, his parents came and listened to his talk. And then we came upstairs to the lab for the party. And I showed them on the computer graphics terminal, the crystal structure with three dimensional glasses. And, and I will never forget, uh, um, his, Chris's mother, she looked at the thing and she said, well, why doesn't he put, you know, make a molecule that goes, that looks like there's a pocket over there. I was like, I told him to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I just was like, oh man, I just love that. I thought like she was going to insist on putting fluorine there. <laughs> yeah, that was, if she had stayed one more day. <laughs> yeah, 100%. Yeah, that, that is pretty cool. That's pretty amazing. So if not science, what would you do? I know you were into sports when you were younger, but that was back in the day. If not science, oh. what would you choose? Boy, yeah, I really don't know. I mean, now that, you know, uh, I, I see what doctors do. I mean, I, I think I wanted to do the MD when I was an undergrad, but, mm -hmm. you know, various reasons didn't get admitted. And sometimes, uh, though the things I've learned now are that you know things you don't get to do that you think you want to do because you weren't admitted sometimes those are the best gifts because mm -hmm. you know you weren't you know it, it, so many other things to do so I actually don't know if you took science away <laughs> where I would go I I definitely love sports. I don't know if I could be a professional cycler. I like to eat, so that wouldn't work. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, I would. Yeah, it wasn't. It, it, uh, it's true that life uh, uh, gives you opportunities, but it's also what you do with it. And you've done all right with your okay, opportunities. So, you, know, you have to. You all have to acknowledge that as well. Yeah. So, tell us something that um, we would be surprised to learn about you. Something surprised. Mm. Wow. Jeez. This is this is the heavy section. These are wow. What would it be? <laughs> I'm terrible at those kind of questions, Rob. Please don't surprise us too much. <laughs> yeah, I know. I mean I, I swing wildly, <laughs> trite or like way too far. <laughs> exactly. TMI. Please. Yes, exactly. I, I can't I can't titrate that. <laughs> <laughs> so if you want, you can leave it at that. <laughs> OK. <laughs> yes. So is there, if you think of something, uh, please let me know. So is there any questions that you think I should have asked? 
that you would like to, or anything you'd like to add? Um, well, the, the first question you asked, it had many parts to it. Uh, and one part I didn't get to answer was, you know, I think you phrased it about like, how does uh, genetics and pharma, like how do they kind of interact? I forget exactly how you said it, um, but it, it kind of, um, um, it, it got to the core of, of sort of why pharma companies work on what they do and how biological insights, you know, come together there. Um, and it really kind of reminds me that a lot of times we, there, there's this disconnect from biology to drugs and there doesn't always have to be, I mean, like, you know, in our, in our, in your fly models with the drugs that we've worked on together, they often really line up. Um, but there's always the chance for a disconnect between like genetically targeting something and pharmacologically targeting something. Mm -hmm. And in my career now, you know, starting back at Princeton, uh, that was such a profound thing because we expect in science things to line up and, um, and when they don't, we, we think one of them is a useless piece of information, right. but um, it's, it's really uh, the flexibility of being able to sort of look at a biological experiment and a chemical, a pharmacological experiment, hold the two results in your head and not be uncomfortable when they don't just beautifully line up, but look for some disconnect and then evolve that. That's what pharma really very rarely can do. And that is, uh, I think they're beginning to see the importance of that, but that's probably, you know, underlying a, a lot of disconnects. And uh, so there's a lot of those results peppered around and we published reviews and things, but uh, I, just, I just love when people, that dawns on them because then you realize, okay, now you're understanding things, yeah. Yeah, I can I can certainly amplify that. Uh, sometimes it, I'm confused. Wait, it it's a biological problem. This does this to the biology. I don't understand why, because the chemical rules don't. I don't understand why the chemical rules would win over the biology. So yeah, I get what you mean. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes it, I'm confused by that. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There's, there's a lot of lot of good discoveries to be made in those kind of sure. areas. Yeah. Absolutely. So anything else you like to add? No, this was great. Thanks for reaching out.